Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to Episode 9 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. Have you ever wondered where the Christmas traditions of stockings, presents, and cookies came from? How about jolly old St. Nicholas? Have you ever wondered about who he was and why we call him Santa Claus? In today's episode, culinary historian Peter G. Rose will help us answer these questions. Peter is the author of the new book, Delicious December, How the Dutch Brought Us Santa, Presents, and Treats. In our conversation, she will reveal the impact that Dutch colonists had on our North American culinary traditions, what American foods have Dutch origins, and how the Dutch celebration of St. Nicholas's Day led to the creation of the American Santa Claus. But before we get to today's conversation, I would like to take a moment to wish you and your families happy holidays. Thank you for making Ben Franklin's World a part of your podcast listening ritual. All right, I think I've held you in suspense long enough. Let's get to our conversation with Peter G. Rose. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us today is Peter G. Rose, a food writer and culinary historian of Dutch foodways in North America. Peter has published nine books and many articles about the influence of Dutch food in North America. Her first book, The Sensible Cook, Dutch Foodways in the Old and the New World, offers a translation of the most influential 17th century cookbook in the Netherlands, The Verstandige Kok. Her most recent book, Delicious December, How the Dutch Brought Us Santa, Presents, and Treats, discusses the Dutch tradition of St. Nicholas's Day and how that tradition influence the birth of the American Santa Claus. But fair warning, this book may make you hungry because it also contains many recipes for traditional St. Nicholas Day cookies, cakes, and breads. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Peter. Well, thank you, Des. Now, personally, I'm very excited to have you on the show. Um, I'm a fan of your work. I've read at least two of your books and many of your articles. And I have found them to be very helpful in my work on the study of early Albany, New York. Um, But they have had the byproduct of I'll be reading them in the library. And then all of a sudden I get really hungry for cookies or uh, strope waffles or or something else that you might be talking about. You're not the only one. (laughs) So before we do... I'm sorry? uh, Well, I was going to say... You're not the only one, and when I give talks, I I know that after 45 minutes, people start to sort of stretch their neck to see what kind of cookies will come once I stop. So uh, getting hungry when someone is talking about food is apparently inevitable. Yeah, it must be a real uh, professional hazard as a food historian um, not to go to the refrigerator all the time. (laughs) Yes, but we try to avoid it. So before we dive into the influence of Dutch food in North America and how the Dutch brought us Santa presents and treats, would you tell us a bit about yourself and how you became interested in the influence of Dutch food in North America? Um, I am an official immigrant. I had a green card for a period of time and then became an American citizen and started uh, a job with a local paper 
writing a family food column. And that paper went out of business, was picked up by a larger one, and eventually I worked for the Gannett uh, newspaper chain, or some people say Gannett. And uh, I worked for them for 22 years as a food columnist. And then, of course... We're in the Hudson Valley, so I started looking into uh, the Dutch influence, which, if you uh, concentrate on it for a moment, there are so many Dutch place names and places, and, of course, historic houses. So I started wondering what Dutch dish can I still eat here? And I was very lucky. Historic Hudson Valley had um, a second edition of the Verstandige Kok. And they suggested I translate it into English. And between that work and the book then coming out, um, I had learned so much about Dutch cooking itself that I really didn't know and how it was brought here. And wow. that's really what started that all. And is the historic Hudson Valley, is that the um, historical organization in Sleepy Hollow, New York? Correct, yes. They administer from Cortland Manor, Phillipsburg Manor, and Washington Irving's house, Sunnyside. And from Cortland Manor uh, was particularly of, of importance to me because at the time, they still gave open house cooking classes there which I took uh, in order to understand the recipes in the book I was translating. Because in Dutch, the word bakken might mean to bake or to fry. So in order to know what the recipe was really doing, I needed to make it. And in order to make it, I needed to know how you cook things over an open fire. So I've learned so many skills and things just by making this translation. Normally, you think you, you, you use your language skills, but in this case, I needed to learn lots more other skills, which was a ton of fun. What was something that surprised you about uh, open fire cooking during your classes? How versatile it is. It's amazingly versatile, particularly if you have a large fireplace like the Cortland Manor has dates to 1749, and uh, it has a very large area in front of it, so you can make little heaps of coal, coal, put a trivet on it, put a pan on it, and you can cook 10 or 12 dishes at the same time. Wow, that sounds like an efficient kick. Yeah, it's fun and interesting. So what American foods have Dutch origins? I'll give you my my list. Okay. Donuts, waffles, wafers, pretzels, pancakes, coleslaw, and above all, cookies. 
Cookies. I do things the Dutch brought here. Well, I, for one, am grateful for all of those. Uh, <laughs> I know. Don't we love them all? So when we talk about these traditions, um, I know that there was a fur trade outpost that was established near present-day Albany, New York in 1614. But the settling of New Netherland doesn't really begin until after the Dutch West India Company was founded in 1621. So before you have colonists, you just have those fur traders at the, at the outpost. So did Dutch food start its migration to North America with the colonization after 1621, or did the traders bring some of their Dutch culinary traditions with them to North America? I'm sure they brought something, but not uh, of any impact as far as I know. Um, Really, it came with the families, the women that came here, and they brought not only their culinary traditions, but their, their just their customs of celebrating. And as you well know, we eat the most on a, a holiday or a fe- at the time of a festival. So, of course, that was the case in the old days as well. And cookbooks then from that period. We have one from that belonged to Mariah Flensler or Rensselaer and Anna the Baster. Very Dutch names, very Albany area names. And they show in the cookbook not only what, how to make something, but very often uh, to make the special dish for that particular occasion. For instance, all, or no, I shouldn't say all, but most of the Dutch handwritten cook scrapbooks that still exist have a recipe for Cumdale, written usually in the English the way it sounds to an English ear, C-O-N-D-A-L-E. And what well, is Cumdale? And um, what's Cumdale? Cumdale is the drink you serve when a baby is born. Oh. So we know that that custom was brought to this country. In Mariah von Rensselaer is the most perfect example, or actually two examples. There is a recipe for dot cookies, funeral biscuits, and she just, Gift, gives the ingredients, but tells that 50 pounds of flour, 10 pounds of butter, um, and I don't remember how many pounds of sugar, make 300 cookies. That's a lot of cookies. And the, the reason for that is that they're as big as a saucer. Now, what were they? They were served at funerals for everyone who came could have, would have, well, now I've made them, and they're really not very good. But then when you read on in the book, there is a recipe for a mulled wine with quite a bit of sugar and spice. And if you dunk your cookie in that malt wine, which was the custom, the cookie is all of a sudden a whole lot better. So the moral of my story is the importance of these kind of cookbooks. And for anyone who listens, I want to urge you, don't throw your grandmother's cookbooks away or 
any little scrapbook she has or a box of recipes, recipe cards, they tell you a lot about her taste and the taste of the family. Sure, and these tastes change over time, so I guess I never thought about it, but a cookbook would be a good way to document how um, people's tastes in food does change over time. True. Um, so if we're talking about change over time, how did the new world influence old Dutch culinary traditions? I mean, certainly they couldn't have gotten all of the ingredients that they had in the old world in the new, but they would have had different ingredients. Exactly. And particularly the Dutch in the Albany area, of course, got their old world foods that were imported by the Dutch West India Company uh, by way of boat, and it took a long time. So they were looking for uh, substitutes. One of the things the Dutch made was uh, pancakes, and they started using pumpkin and cornmeal in their pancakes instead of wheat flour, uh, you know, as we usually do. And they used pumpkin to make a sweet meat by cooking it down and then drying it, and it makes a delicious kind of candy. So they substitute it, as you well can imagine. They also adopted what the uh, American Indians ate, and that is as particularly in, in the northern trading area, the Dutch dealt with the Mohawk. The Mohawk ate a cornmeal mush called sapan or sapan, and uh, it was strictly a ground cornmeal with water. But the Dutch come from a dairy country. So they made the same kind of porridge, but then they poured milk on it to make it more the way a porridge was made at home. Now, I, I read about the sapon. Um, have you ever tried to make it, and what does it taste like? Oh, it tastes quite nice. Yeah. Yeah. There is nothing wrong with it. It's filling. It's good taste of corn. Um, Yeah, I like it. I also like the cornbread. Nate, some quite a few years ago now, I worked with um, a man on the Seneca Reservation who was preparing the feast for a tribal meeting of the Seneca in Salamanca, New York. And we made all the traditional dishes, including cornmeal mush and cornbread, the way the Indians made it, Um, meaning that the uh, the corn was ground and uh, put together in uh, bread form, small round loaves, which were not baked but boiled. And then when we had done it, you know, we had this pan full of corn water and we carefully put it in big jars. And the older Senecans drank it as a healthful, warm drink. And that was the custom uh, in, you know, centuries ago. So they drank the water that they boiled the cornbread in. Yeah. Wow. And it makes perfect health sense 
the good things that were left in the water. And they kept it warm, particularly in winter, and it made a good drink. Hmm. Yeah, interesting, huh? It's all these discoveries, of course, have taken me years to experience. uh, And they've always, they put a smile on your face. You say, (laughs) huh, yeah. And you can perfectly well imagine it. Now, in all of your uh, research, it sounds like the Dutch adopted some Native American recipes to suit their needs and Native American foods to suit their needs. But did the Native Americans adopt any Dutch culinary traditions? Uh, Ultimately, yes. I, um, I, for one thing, the Dutch trade had cooking pots, uh, the the brass cooking pots. Oh, with kettles, yeah. Tinned kettles, yes. Uh, tinned on the inside. And in the beginning, they would take them apart and they would make um, knee rattles when, for, uh, when they were dancing. But ultimately, they took over. They used the kettles for what they were meant for, and their own um, earthenware kind of disappeared. And that sort of was the beginning of becoming more European. So they ultimately would adopt the kettles to cook in them. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and we have lots of records. Of course, if you live in the Albany area, you're aware of the New Netherland Institute. The New Netherland Institute is part of the New York State Library and has since 1974 translated all the Dutch documents that were left from the early Dutch period. And I'm told they are about 60% finished. And in those records, we find um, stories where Indians would come and buy wheat bread in what's now Albany, uh, from the Europeans, wheat bread, which of course is much softer, it has a different crumb uh, than cornbread, which is crumbly, uh, was very well liked by Native Americans. And they also uh, particularly liked the Dutch sweet things. There's a lovely court case where a baker was accused of selling a Native American a sweet bun, and he couldn't very well protest that he didn't do it because the person was seen coming out of his house munching on it. So here again are old papers that bring... Uh, the 17th century alive that that make it make the people very real and the circumstances very real. So the New Netherland Institute, as it's called now, is doing an enormous service for for all of us to understand the the early Europeans in this area. Yeah, and I have benefited from their work. Um, and I know the court case that you, I've read the court case you were talking about. And I, I also recall an ordinance uh, telling the bakers, you you have to make enough bread for the community to eat and stop baking so many cookies and pretzels for, for the Native Americans for the fur trade. Yeah. But um, if we could transition now to St. Nicholas, um, can you tell us who St. Nicholas was and why the Dutch celebrate St. Nicholas Day? Um. St. Nicholas was 
presume to have been born around 350, 54, in what is now Turkey, in a place called Patara. And he was a very uh, religious man, very pious, and became the bishop of a small town nearby called Myra. And in order to sort of locate it in your mind, it's very close to the coast. And if you look on the map and find the island of Rhodes in Greece and Cyprus, it's sort of between there in what's now Turkey. He was a pious man and had many miracles and particularly uh, miracles to do with sailors, saving them from, you know, uh, with storms and so forth. And it was the sailors who spread his fame all uh, along the seacoast, including, and his fame was spread to the lowlands, as well as Russia, you know, and as well as then South Germany and France. And the Dutch being big sailors and and really having earned their fortune from their uh, exploits, from their traveling and building boats and so forth, uh, of course, adopted him as their particular saint. Now, his St. Nicholas Day was already known in the Roman calendar uh, as, as December 6th, so that's generally called St. Nicholas Day. However, the Dutch celebrated always on the eve of the Saint's Day. So they'd and by the way, the a Saint's day. day is not the Saint's Day of birth, but it's the day he died and presumably went to heaven. So that was the day for Saint Nicholas. And the Dutch started to celebrate, particularly the eve of that day, so December 5th. At first, it was a day or an event for children only. Children would get presents if they had been good. That's always the story. And there are beautiful paintings, particularly by Jan Steen in the Netherlands, that show the celebration. And for any Dutchman, the story is very clear. It's a picture of a family being all together and uh, delicious Things have been brought by St. Nicholas by way of the chimney. The children have placed their shoe or their wooden shoe by the chimney. And he has come and brought all this for you. But if you've been naughty, well, you're going to find switches in your shoe. Switches are simply a bunch of twigs for spanking. And that's also very clearly portrayed. It wasn't until after World War II that the Feast of St. Nicholas, known as the Kinder Feast, or Children's Feast, changed 
to involve adults as well, and it became the major gift, became and still is the major gift giving occasion for the Dutch. So we have we have gifts. We have wooden shoes by the chimney with care. Saint Nicholas brings uh, goodies and treats. So when does Saint Nicholas or Sinterklaas become the American Santa Claus? Well, the Dutch brought the custom here. We have a record uh, of a baker in Albany who records that in 1676, Mariah von Rensselaer bought St. Nicholas goods, meaning goodies, from him. So we know it was celebrated here early on. And the Dutch always assumed it as their particular holiday. By 1809, Washington Irving uh, published his book, uh, The History of New York. And in it, he describes the Dutch, uh, most, you know, very, in a spoofing kind of a way, but, but nice. And he describes how on December 5th, St. Nicholas will ride over the roofs and bring uh, wonderful things for children. And that idea um, really sparks the imagination of the Americans. And from there, um, Santa Claus was sent that far away. Now, in Dutch, we say Sinterklaas. And if you say it Sinterklaas, it almost like, sounds like Santa Claus, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Uh, I only discovered that after I've been married 40 years. I said it to my husband, and he really... Thought I said Santa Claus, and that was for the first time I really thought about it. But anyway, um, Washington Irving started it, and then pretty soon, uh, of course, uh, Clement Moore's poem was very influential, and ultimately, illustrators starting adding. Uh, pictures and adding things to it, including the North Pole and all of that. And it became a, a real American figure. On top of that, the English already had a Father Christmas figure. And America is such a melting pot of ethnic groups that things can so easily be adopted and adapted and become a uniquely American figure. Uh, and that's what happened in the case of Santa Claus. The American Santa Claus is a combination of, of Dutch Santa Claus and, and St. Nicholas there and, and the English Father Christmas. I and, uh, believe it is, yes. And Washington Irving, he, he was he was a rock star of his day, so I guess I'm not surprised that in his uh, novel Diedrich Knickerbocker's History of New York, which is a spoof yeah. on, on making fun of old Dutch traditions, uh, I, I guess I'm not surprised that he, he, he would have brought that, uh, caused that tradition to begin. Exactly. I appreciate your time. We've been talking for a while. We've already run a little bit over. Um, but before we go... Um, we just, I'd like to just take a few minutes, um, if you don't mind, so we can do the time warp. And the time warp is our fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Are you ready? Okay. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future but they can speculate about what might have been. 
Okay, so just a, a little bit of background or context before I get to my question here. So the English seized New Netherland from the Dutch in 1664, just before the, the Second Anglo-Dutch War. And the English split it into New Netherland into four colonies, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and they gave some of New Netherland's land holdings to the colony of New York. But the Dutch retake New York from the English in 1673, only to return it to England a year later in 1674. So my question is, in your opinion, how might the Dutch have continued to influence North American foodways and culture if the Dutch had not returned New York to the English in 1674? I think, in a way, they continued that influence. Maybe not as strongly if they had uh, retained the area, but there were still so many Dutch uh, or people of Dutch descent here that uh, they who had by now um, made money and owned land. So they were the influential class and and still in some ways uh, retained their Dutchness or at least their Dutch customs. And I, I I, I'm sure their influence would have been much stronger if they had retained their power here. But uh, I, I think they still uh, influenced the American kitchen even in the 19th century, if only by the custom of New Year's visiting. So I I don't I can't say that it it would have been that much stronger because it was already an amalgam of of cultures. And and you're referring of course to the 19th century migration of um there was a big 19th century migration of exactly. Dutch people to the Midwest. So Holland, Michigan um is a is a relic of that migration. Now, exactly. Before, before we conclude, what research project are you working on now? Do you have a research project? Um, right this minute, not, but uh, right now I'm very busy with giving talks uh, about St. Nicholas and the new book, uh, but I have started to look into the Holland Land Company and their, what they brought to New York other than money. And, and the Holland Land Company, that's the late 18th century, so late 1700s and into the 19th century? Right. Am I? Yep. Exactly, yeah. 1792, I think, is sort of the beginning of it. And it it ran through until after the Erie Canal was uh, finished. So probably the 1850s. Wow. So where is the best place for people to look for more information about you and your work or how to get in contact with you? How kind of you. My website www.peterroseoneword.com. Great, and I will uh, include a link to that in the show notes. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Peter. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but that conversation has left me hungry. It has also left me grateful to the Dutch colonists who brought so many delicious baked goods to North America. I am also grateful to Washington Irving, the man who inspired Americans to adapt the Dutch Sinterklaas, or St. Nicholas, to fit their cultural needs. I enjoy Christmas, and part of my enjoyment comes from the image of and inspiration provided by Santa Claus. 
You can find more information about Peter, her new book, Delicious December, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, which you'll find at benfranklinsworld.com slash zero zero nine. And if you can find time during this busy holiday season to rate and review Ben Franklin's World, I'd really appreciate it. You can rate and review this show on iTunes or Stitcher. Your ratings will help us keep Ben Franklin's World visible and findable for other history lovers who are not yet aware of our show. So they're really important. And if you give Ben Franklin's World a five-star rating and leave a review, I'll be sure to mention your name in an upcoming episode as a small way to say thank you. To rate and review Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history, just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash iTunes or benfranklinsworld.com slash Stitcher. And finally, if you have any questions, comments, or you just want to talk about history or the show, please send me an email to liz at benfranklinsworld.com or tweet me at Liz Kovart. Have happy holidays, everyone. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.